Well, thank you. Thank you for, I think, uh, hopefully everyone can hear us. Thank you for that introduction. Neil, I was thinking about um, the discussion we had before we started here, and there's, uh, there's a disconnect sometimes in the discourse where people talk about these issues of Islamist extremism, of seeing them uh, as something of the Middle East and something of the Arab and Muslim world. Obviously, there's a connection. Uh, but there are other very interesting, very revolutionary um, uh, movements occurring, not just in the East, but in the West. And you, of a scholar, especially of the West, especially of, of, of the history of ideas, I, I wonder if you could give us kind of a broad brush look at the moment that we're in right now, which all too often we tend to isolate geographically, thinking this is a problem of a specific culture, or specific society. Talk about the broader moment that we're all living in right now. Well, thanks, Albert, and, and thanks, uh, Greg, for that introduction, General Hall. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, it was an opportunity I seized because all too often I noticed that professors at institutions like Harvard uh, and Stanford spend too little time interacting with uh, practitioners, uh, and in particular practitioners dealing with the hard military problems as well as the diplomatic problems posed uh, by Islamist extremism. It's kind of, to me, striking that your, your whole conference has the, the name Sovereign Challenge and the subheading, a global network for a global command, because I'm increasingly struck by the tension in the world today between networks and sovereigns. Uh, I think this is a generalized problem that applies to every single country that is represented here. Uh, and although its, its symptoms are most acute uh, in those parts of the Muslim world where violent extremists operate, we shouldn't kid ourselves into ignoring the somewhat less uh, obvious symptoms everywhere. L let me put it in the broadest possible terms. Most of history is the story of an interplay between hierarchical structures like states, like sovereign states, and distributed networks. And for most of history, the hierarchical structures have the upper hand uh, for reasons that are more or less self-evident. The hierarchical organizations are good at defense, networks not so much, and if you don't believe me, ask Mark Zuckerberg. But there are periods in history when technological changes empower distributed networks relative to hierarchical structures like states. And we're in one of those moments now. I think you could argue that it began in the 1970s with the first uh, advances in the direction of not only personal computing, but also the internet. Uh, but it's reached an extraordinary crescendo in the last 10 years. When I wrote uh, the book Colossus about American power uh, back at the beginning of the Iraq war, none of the major technology companies that now dominate uh, the global landscape uh, had reached anything like their current level of power, and some didn't even exist, such as Facebook. So I want to argue, and I think this may be a helpful framework, that we live at a time that more closely resembles the 16th and 17th centuries than it resembles the early part of our lives. Because we grew up when the sovereign states, and especially the really big, strong ones like the United States, were truly sovereign had not been, uh, had not had their power eroded by networks. And in our time, as after most of us had become adults, uh, there was this dramatic expansion of the scale and speed of distributed networks, especially thanks to network platforms like Google, Facebook, not to mention uh, Amazon and Apple. That's a lot like what happened to Europe after the printing press was introduced and spread as a technology with astonishing speed, empowering ideas that would have simply been snuffed out as heresy in any previous century. So the way I think about this is, put yourself back 500 years to the moment when Martin Luther announced his proposed reformation of the Roman Catholic Church, of Western Christianity. 
and realize that what happened after that is a lot like what we're living through now. With astonishing viral speed, his ideas spread throughout Central Europe and then further afield. But, and this is the last point I'll make, instead of producing what Luther thought he was going to produce, which was a priesthood of all believers, a wonderful utopia in which everybody would have a direct relationship to God, he ended up triggering roughly a century and a half of religious conflict. And in the same way, I think Mark Zuckerberg sincerely thought he would create a global community of interconnected people all around the world. And he is genuinely shocked and surprised to find that far from producing that, he's producing astonishing levels of polarization, political, religious, social, cultural, and this is affecting the West just as much as it's affecting the Muslim world. That's uh, uh, <laughs> both fascinating and, uh, and daunting. I wonder, um, when we look at Luther, when we think of the uh, 16th and 17th century, of course, we're thinking of a technology, we're thinking of, uh, uh, of, of the printing press, but that was a tool to communicate an idea or ideas. And indeed, Luther had a very specific view of what he wanted, and it was quickly something that got out of his control. And you had all kinds of exotic variations of Lutheranism. Uh, you know, you had the kind of a free love republic of anarchists in Munster, Germany yeah, for a while, and all kinds of strange permutations. Once, once, the, once the limits were off, it went in all directions. Could talk to us about the connection between technology and the idea. You've written so powerfully about the rise of the United Kingdom uh, in one of your books, and the rise of the United States, and the ideas that led to that. How is this new technology going to affect, or new, the way technologies are going to affect ideas? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the Anabaptists. Because I sometimes think when I'm trying to understand ISIS or Daesh or Islamic State, whatever we're going to call it, it, it helps to remind oneself of those extreme cults produced by the European Reformation. And Jan of Leiden was a kind of al-Baghdadi figure. Uh, it's just that uh, the Anabaptists achieved much less in terms of death and destruction. Uh, than ISIS has uh, unfortunately been able to achieve. And I think that's partly because uh, the technologies that are available in the early 21st century are just so much more empowering of networks of extremists than, than the, net, the technologies that were available back in the, uh, in the 16th and 17th century. So one thing to remember is that today's problem of coping with uh, extremists, I mean, it's harder. It's, it's a bigger problem than the problem that confronted the monarchs of early modern Europe. The other big issue, if one's trying to paint with the broadest brush of uh, modern history is why did the West become so much richer and stronger uh, than everybody else after around about that time? So if you really try to simplify all of world history into a single chart, it's a chart that starts in around 1600 and it shows the ratio of per capita income in uh, North America relative to the ratio of per capita uh, to the ratio of per capita income in North America relative to per capita income in pretty much anywhere else, but let's take China where a fifth of humanity lives. And that ratio goes from maybe two to one to about 22 to one uh, using the standard Madison data for, uh, for global economic development. So something amazing happened in the world uh, starting in around about the 1600s that propelled People in Western Europe, and I should really say Northwestern Europe, and those places where people from Northwestern Europe settled in large numbers, to a position of amazing dominance, not only in economic terms, but in every sense, and ultimately in political terms too, because it was those people who established the global empires that 100 years ago still dominated the landscape and only really began to unravel after World War II. So there are lots and lots of really bad answers to the question, why did the West become so dominant? And part of the problem we have in academic life today is that those bad answers are still remarkably dominant. That the worst answer is, oh, it was imperialism. 
And that is still a standard answer on the left all around the world. That can't be right because every other civilization did empire. It was the least original thing that people from Northwestern Europe did. And they came pretty late to the empire party. The Chinese had been doing empire for centuries before West Europeans decided to try their hand. So in a book called Civilization, I made the argument that it couldn't really be empire that explained this extraordinary dominance, because why did the empires of other countries not have the same effect? And I tried to boil it down to six different ideas and institutions that help us understand Western predominance. Uh, and those ideas are, uh, are not immediately obvious, but they turn out to be very potent, so potent that I called them the killer applications. So the killer apps of Western civilization were competition, the idea that competition is legitimate, both politically and economically. The scientific revolution, which differentiated Western Europe from everywhere else. Even neighboring territories in what we then thought of as the Levant, the Ottoman Empire, played no part whatever in the scientific revolution. Then the idea of the rule of law based on private property rights. There was a rule of law all uh, around the world, every civilization developed its own legal system, but something about what happened in the Northwestern European legal order was distinctive. And it seems to have been this emphasis on private property rights. And I'll add the other three quickly. Modern medicine, which doubled then trebled life expectancy. Uh, the consumer society, which created markets for mass-produced clothing. If you don't have that, there's no point having an industrial revolution. And finally, the work ethic. A hundred years ago, Max Weber thought that the work ethic must be in some way connected to Protestantism. But that turns out to be wrong. Because in fact, every single one of those six killer applications can be downloaded by any country, any civilization, any culture. They're not racially specific. Uh, they're not specific in terms of religion. They all work everywhere. And so the most striking feature of our time has been that some of the most populous countries in the world belatedly have copied these institutions, downloaded the killer apps, and ended this period where the West essentially dominated economically and in every other respect. And I think that's a very optimistic message. If, if part one of my story is, look out, we're kind of rerunning the Reformation and the wars of religion, part two is, you know, be of good cheer, because the killer applications that made the West prosperous and powerful are open source. Anybody can download them. And anywhere where the experiment has been tried, any country that has adopted at least four or five of those killer apps has done well. South Korea versus North Korea. The old uh, West Germany versus East Germany. It's, it's very clear from history that institutions and ideas are fungible. And they can operate regardless of your race, religion, history. And that's a very optimistic message that everybody in this room, I think, can feel good about. It's interesting you pick 1600 as a date because, of course, that is a period, and you've, you've written about this as well, where in the East, in the large part of the world, uh, which we often call the Muslim world, there were these three great empires, and indeed they were empires, and they were quite successful empires. Yeah. You had the Ottoman Empire, which threatened Europe, which were a couple weeks away from Lepanto, which yeah. was this great victory celebrated in the world, which was blip, actually, on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the advance of, of the Ottomans deep, deep into, into Europe. You had Safavid Persia. You had the, the glories of Mughal India. Yeah. These were not only military successful, expansive imperialist powers, they were also wealthy powers. Yeah. And yet, they were not able to compete with the implication or the implementation of these killer apps that happened in, uh, in, in Northwestern yeah. Europe. It's, it's true, and indeed, I think one of the things that uh, Western historians need to keep doing is to remind themselves how advanced those three uh, Islamic empires looked uh, as late as uh, the late 17th century, when it was still possible for an Ottoman army to get as far as the gates of Vienna and besiege that city, uh, when the entire area of the Balkans was still under Ottoman rule. And 
The Mughals were a pretty impressive operation when the British started arriving in significant numbers uh, in uh, the 18th century. And I, I think the key point here is let's just recognize how powerful and prosperous they were. The deviation or divergence uh, between the West and Turkey or the Ottoman Empire was much less than the divergence relative to China. The Ottoman Empire was significantly more prosperous uh, than Imperial China uh, in the Ming and, and Qing periods. So, so what went wrong is a really interesting question to which I think we're gradually getting uh, better and better answers. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of points. Number one, I mentioned already, the scientific revolution just didn't happen in the Ottoman Empire. And that's surprising because it wasn't geographically that far away from major centers of scientific learning. So we have to explain why there were no network effects. Why did the centers of learning in the Ottoman world simply not pick up the signal that was being beamed out of every major European university and and city that there was some major advances in our understanding of the natural world going on and in our methods uh, of conducting uh, experiments. I think that can be attributed partly to the dominance of the clergy at critical moments. And I talk about Taki al Din's observatory being demolished uh, in the 16th century because the theologians argued that it was blasphemous to inquire into the thinking of God. Now, when that argument was deployed uh, in Europe, as it was against Galileo, it was ultimately overridden. And that was partly because the Reformation so divided the clergy and s fragmented uh, the churches of Christendom that they just could not stop the scientific revolution from happening. But in effect, uh, the Muslim clergy stopped the scientific revolution from happening. The other interesting point, uh, which is made in a book called The, uh, the Long Divergence, is that Ottoman legal institutions were much less friendly to what we call capitalism, to the formation of joint stock corporations, to all the institutions that we now take for granted that only arose in Europe in the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. And they didn't really get uh, uh, underway anywhere in the uh, major Muslim empires uh, because the legal order did not favor the creation of such institutions. So these are important arguments. They may sound a little bit nerdy and academic, I think they're important politically because they remind us that the divergences of historical paths that occurred in the last 500 years were not preordained by the religions or the cultures, uh, much less the races of the people living in these different parts of the world. Uh, in some respects, it was dumb luck that made the West successful. It was, for example, the fragmentation of European politics, the lack of a great empire in Europe, that encouraged the competition to improve weaponry that ultimately set Europe on a path of technological innovation. This is a really important argument that's been made by a number of different historians. Ultimately, what Europe is, is a laboratory for military research and development. And that's because war is an almost constant feature of European life right the way through the centuries, pretty much from the Dark Ages until 1945. And there's nothing quite like that going on in the Eastern, in the Oriental world. The asymmetries, for example, between the Chinese Empire and the so-called barbarians it had to uh, contend with meant that there was never that much incentive to get really good at weaponry. But the European great powers are kind of similar. They're about at the same level in terms of econ economic capability, and they certainly all of the ability to introduce gunpowder, introduce superior uh, naval vessels, introduce more effective cannons. All that stuff means that it's an arms race that propels Europe forward. And Ian Morris, my colleague at Stanford, another British historian, has a book uh, called War, What Is It Good For? that you'll probably all enjoy because the answer is quite a lot, actually. <laughs> you know, you talked about, uh, we we're talking about networks and you, you mentioned Mark Zuckerberg and the, you know, the state is powerful. States are powerful. States have, of course, more than anything else, they have coercive powers. The powers of police, intelligence, military, security apparatus. This is real power. And I remember being in government uh, years ago and hearing people, and it's, it's not a partisan thing, it was, there was bipartisan uh, 
uh, on both sides uh, uh, feeling about this that, well, you know, ideology, uh, you know, the things of the mind, Alberto, those are very well and good, but what matters is throw weight, what matters is firepower, what matters um, is are those very tangible things. States still, I mean, despite of bad actors like the Islamic State, states still, nation states still have largely a monopoly on, on coercive powers. And yet we see, especially in the Middle East, but in other places as well, the state coming back, but it's not strong like before. These are fragile states. These are states that seem a shell of what they were in the past. I wonder if you could talk about that, about that connection that exists between, or that, that divergence that exists between the world of ideas and the world of technology and kind of the power of the state and how they interact with each other and how one can subvert the other. Sometime after 9-11, uh, there was a nice newspaper column, I think it was in the LA Times, which nobody reads, so it's largely forgotten. Uh, the, the point he made was that um, there had been this network-based attack on the United States, but the, the federal government was going into action using its usual, uh, its usual mode of operation as a hierarchical uh, administrative state. It wanted to find some targets to exact retribution. The first was Afghanistan, the second was Iraq, and it wanted to deploy... Uh, its full arsenal of, of shock and awe. And the author of the piece, whose name I'm forgetting, observed shrewdly that this would backfire and that unleashing all the power of, this, of the superpower on the phenomenon of Al-Qaeda would probably create an ever, an, an ever larger enemy rather than achieve victory. This was a, a very good insight. And I think this is the way to think about your question. States have generally underestimated the extent to which the technical or technological revolutions empower distributed networks. They don't really understand networks. That's the reality. What I've found in researching my new book, reading a lot of network science, is that even the people running the network platforms don't understand too well the consequences of creating giant, very fast working networks. They don't understand the extent to which the phenomenon of homophily leads to self-segregation into clusters. If you create a giant network, it's not just a lattice in which everybody talks to everybody else. Uh-uh. Echo chambers form really quickly as people gravitate towards like-minded people in the network. Preferential attachment means that as the network grows, it becomes more and more unequal because people prefer to be connected to the super tweeters and not to the nobodies. Uh, and crucially, network structure affects the speed at which ideas go viral. And broadly speaking, nobody post 9-11 in any position of power sufficiently recognized the viral quality of this new iteration of Salafist Islam. And they failed to realize that this idea in its own right could go viral, could spread through new technological channels and reach people all over the world. Now, I think we're gradually getting a handle this, on this, and some of you who work in cybersecurity will have seen some of the frankly terrifying diagrams of the Islamic State online network. Uh, the extraordinary difficulty Twitter and Facebook have is the game of whack-a-mole of trying to stop these organizations from using their platforms. And whack-a-mole is the only way to describe it because you shut one uh, account down, five more open. So I think in, in the end, it wasn't just that we didn't engage in the battle of ideas, we also failed to understand that the ideas that we were up against were spreading virally through networks we'd created. And we were incredibly slow to understand the significance of that phenomenon. I still don't think we fully grasp uh, its implications. One other point I'd add. I think when we were confronted with this ideology, which you're calling here Islamist extremism, I think that's a good formulation. I prefer it to Islamic, because I think Islamism is a distinctive political ideology derived from Islam. That ideology could not simply be defeated in the field of battle. And it was a huge category error that both the Bush and Obama administrations made to say, 
we're not going to really talk about the connection to Islam. We're going to focus on violent extremism. And if we focus on violent extremism and whack the guys who do violence, we'll win. But sorry. Nonviolent extremism derived from Islamism is the virus. That's the thing that goes through the network like crazy. And not everybody who connects with it, whether they live in London uh, or, for that matter, in uh, uh, Baghdad, not everybody who connects with that ideology says, right, I'm done. I'm going to go out and get in a white van and run a bunch of people over. Actually, that rarely happens. But what commonly happens is that young alienated, mostly men, but not only men, say, you know what, this kind of explains why my life sucks. And I like the fact that this has some kind of moral absolute quality to it. So I'm kind of with the program. Nothing violent has happened. Essentially, a young person has engaged with something online. Then they find their friends in the physical world. Their physical network is like, yeah, I heard about that too. And that's the point at which it becomes viral. And then you've created the setting within which acts of violence can be planned and executed. And we have failed pretty badly in addressing that problem, that the problem of non-violent Islamist extremism, it's the necessary precondition for any violent act. And we've been remarkably passive as it's gone viral through the platforms that we ourselves created. You know, I, uh, hearing what you said, I, I'm reminded of the late 2015 Pew study on um, attitudes in the Muslim world, which showed uh, a minority of Muslims are in favor of the ideology of ISIS. That's good news. But actually, that minority was millions of people. I remember in the poll, there were 14 million Nigerians that were, according to the poll, were willing to tell a pollster, I have positive views of the Islamic State. Six million in Turkey. There were millions of people, obviously, Millions of people did not join ISIS. That's, that's, right. so that's good yeah. news. But, uh, but certainly it, the, the pool or the, the number of people that were somehow sympathetic to the message was far larger than the actual number of right. people who left their homes, found a way to get to Syria and Iraq, and unleashed mayhem. Yeah. You're working for a much larger pool. I wonder, when you talk about technology and you talk about killer apps, is the West especially, but not just the West. I think nation states in, in the East that are confronting this. Are they at a disadvantage because we say it's almost a cliche, you need a network to fight a network. You need an idea to fight an idea. And Salafi jihadism is an idea. And it has an, its own internal logic. It has its own history. Mythological, you know, I don't mean Islam is mythological. I mean it picks and chooses from Islam what it likes and what it doesn't like. Are we at a disadvantage? Western states, our allies in the region, that basically we don't have a thing to counter that other thing. Well, we used to have one. It's uh, amazing to go back and look at the history of the Cold War and see how tremendously confident American and uh, not only American uh, leaders of major Western states were in arguing that we had a way of life that was in every respect superior to communism. There was no embarrassment about make the, making this claim, and there was a full spectrum effort to make the claim that ran from nuclear weapons programs to sending Louis Armstrong to play concerts uh, in uh, the Eastern Bloc. Uh, we, we were not apologetic about our own civilization in the Cold War. We've been completely apologetic uh, about it uh, in this war. And I think there's a couple of things going on there. One is that I think because Islamist extremism is connected to Islam, uh, we've been inhibited, especially Americans have been inhibited, about talking about it and recognizing it as an ideology which has to be opposed ideologically. This terror of going near the I-word, which became almost 
paralyzing in the Obama administration, I think is part of the reason that we haven't been able to figure out what it is that we're for if that's what we're against. I mean, if you are committed to the idea of religious toleration, then obviously you're committed to the idea that Islam should be on the same footing as Roman Catholicism uh, in the United States. The problem is, if Islam includes in it a political project to create a caliphate and impose Sharia law on the citizens of every society, it's pretty hard to put them on that same footing. So I think that's part of the difficulty. But the other part of the difficulty has been a generalized loss of confidence within Western elites in the values that we associate with the term Western civilization. You're not even allowed to teach a class on Western civilization at Stanford. It was abolished decades ago as politically incorrect. So one of the challenges I've had as an academic has been in making any claims about the superiority of Western institutions and ideas, I immediately incur the wrath of the cultural relativists who want to tell me, A, that everything the West did was bad, uh, and B, other civilizations should be put on an equal footing. And when I object that, yeah, but these institutions and ideas in the West were what achieved economic growth, the equality of the sexes, and much else that you all are in favor of here at Harvard or Stanford, there's a kind of confusion. So I think we both don't know how to deal with an ideology that derives from religion, and we don't really know what we stand for anymore that is in clear opposition to that ideology. And that means that we are very, very ineffective in the battle for ideas, although battle's the wrong word. It's not really a battle at all. Conflict between ideas, conflict between ideologies is not like military conflict. It's not actually something that military men should be doing. It's really a, a struggle that goes on in educational institutions. And we were talking last night about this. I'll give you a specific example of how winnable the battle of ideas is. Somalia is not a country renowned for its prosperity or its stability. I know a bit about it because I'm married to a Somali. And yet, when my friend Jonathan Starr set up a Barso school in Somaliland, more than five years ago now. His only proposition was, I'm going to teach your kids science. I'm going to teach them languages. No religion. That's your department. I'm just going to teach them the, the subjects they need to know if they want to get into a Western college. And within a very short time, that school went from being an object of local suspicion to being the most valued institution in the neighborhood because Jonathan was getting kids into major American institutions, including Harvard. And once these large Somali families saw members going off and getting uh, places at Harvard, any resistance they might have had, any suspicion that they might have had towards him, melted away. It's actually quite simple. If there's a madrasa here funded from the Gulf and a school there funded by, in this case, a private philanthropist from the United States, which one are people going to choose? The trouble is we've hardly given any communities that choice. We essentially absented ourselves from a competition to educate people, not only in the Muslim world, but more generally. I think that's, if I had to point to a single major mistake in US and I'd say also European policy over the last 30 years, it's been the failure to engage in what would have been an easy competition to produce better schools and offer better educational opportunities. We just didn't show up. Yeah, yeah it's uh, ironic when you consider that um, the West, not just governments, but the West, the uh, private sector in the West, uh, uh, invested so much in education. And even in the region, you know, one of the pioneers of, of, uh, of that education in, in, in the Middle East was actually American, mostly American missionary activity. And there was that period from 1866 from the founding of the Syrian Protestant College in Beirut, which became AUB, uh, and then 50 years until, the, until uh, the First World War, when a host of cutting edge Roberts University, which still exists yeah. in, in uh, Istanbul, were set up to kind of inculcate that, uh, that worldview. And, and it actually bore a lot of fruit. Absolutely. 
How do we go, I mean, you, you know, you talked about the period that we're in and you, you know, you painted this very kind of, for those of us who know history, you know, the, the uh, 30 years war, the years before the peace of Westphalia, this is a, a, this is a, a, a period of mass slaughter, of, uh, of, of extreme violence, of extreme rhetoric and all of this. Where, where is safety for the world today in, in, in looking at that space? Is it in promoting secularism? Is it in promoting education? You've touched on these things. What, you know, what makes sense in this world where all the, all the foundations of power, intellectual, political, religious, cultural, are shaking? What, what is maybe not the safe place, but the safer place? <laughs> for people to look at. Let me answer that, Alberto, and then I think we should take some questions from the, the audience. Um, I'm always nervous when I hear the word safe these days because safe spaces have become the kind of <laughs> the symbol of a, a culture of intellectual cowardice that is rampant on American campuses. I much prefer unsafe spaces uh, where you can say things that people won't necessarily agree with or find at all comfortable. Look, I think the network age is at a relatively early stage. And the ways in which pathologies of polarization, uh, viral ideas, and, uh, and extremist organizations will continue to be a major concern for the rest of our lives. And I'd almost be tempted to say, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, because I think we will start to see more and more these kinds of extremist organizations and networks proliferating outside the Muslim world. Uh, there's no particular reason why it should only be in the Muslim world that this sort of phenomenon occurs. What can we do? I think we need to make a kind of global division between church and state, between religion and politics. Uh, we need as far as possible to establish that those people who want to live in the United States uh, need to recognize that they're accepting the separation of religion and politics as one of the absolutely central foundations of the system. If they accept it, that means relinquishing dreams of a caliphate and relinquishing dreams of, of Sharia law as the organizing principle for their societies. That is not an option in the United States. And if that's what you want, you've come to the wrong place. That doesn't seem like such a hard argument to make. And I hope we can all still agree in this country that the Constitution is a pretty good thing. That's been the basis of this country's success after all. Secondly, I think we need to look at uh, what we do in the realm of aid, but not only state aid, governmental aid, but non-governmental aid, and get everybody together, including the billionaires with their giving pledge, and say, can we just build more schools like a Barso school? Why don't we just aim to build 100,000 of those schools a year, focusing on giving people access all over the world to the kind of education that people in this room want for their kids. Again, that doesn't seem like rocket science, uh, but it just requires us to reassess our delivery mechanisms for both public and private philanthropy. If we could all agree on improved education without any religious strings are tied, we're just gonna teach you guys physics, uh, that seems to me that, that like the Apollo mission, the Apollo program of our time, and yet it's simple. It isn't even very expensive to build a good school in Somalia. You know, we together, the people in this room, with, the, with money that we can spare, could build a school in any one of the countries that we currently consider to be failed or, or, or close to failure. So it's not as if it's difficult. But I don't think if we, if we fail to do that, we stand any chance of resisting the kinds of dangerous effects of the networked age. And my ultimate nightmare is indeed that we end up reenacting the European wars of religion in the greater Middle East. And that is a truly grim prospect in an age of nuclear proliferation, uh, cyber warfare, and God knows what other weapons. All they had back then was, you know, muskets, cannons, and burning people at the stake. Uh, if we were having wars of religion in our time, uh, we, we could end up with a body count in the millions, and that's a truly terrifying prospect.
Certainly. Certainly, I think I, um, right before we open up, I mean, certainly the idea that we often forget when we deal with the question of uh, Islamist extremism is how much the moment we arrived at, is, if you look at the Middle East, actually was not something which happened <coughs> by chance. This was people investing over time in the levers of mobilization, people investing in education, uh, Salafi education, people investing in the media, people investing in publishing, people investing in schools of religion. It didn't happen just one day that people woke up and decided, I'm going to follow this political, socio-political, religious movement. Money, time was spent for decades to do it. That's why you look at a movie, say an Egyptian movie from the 1940s, and you look at an Egyptian movie from the, you look at television from the region today. A 1940s Egyptian movie looks like a Hollywood movie from the 1940s. It's, the ground has shifted, but it was shifted intentionally. It didn't just happen by chance, it was created. Yeah. So when you talk about schools, it's something that you have to do. Yeah. It does, just doesn't happen organically. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>